When did God lose his power? Never. He is still the same every single day. God is always the same. So uh, good morning. Again, I'd like to welcome you to Hope Community Fellowship, and I'd like to thank you for choosing to come and worship the Lord with us this morning. If this is your first time here, we're really excited to have you here with us. And if it's not your first time here, we're still excited to have you here with us also, but we'd like to just welcome you back. So our parable today, the parable of the wicked tenants, it's one of the seven parables that's told in all three of the synoptic gospels. And so our passage today is going to be from Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 18. So please join me there in your Bible, if you would. Our study of the parables that Jesus told has come primarily from the book of Luke. But to give better understanding to the parable today, we're going to be using all three of the synoptic gospels in this. Now, this parable, it occurs immediately after the triumphal entry, you know, where Jesus rides into Jerusalem, uh, you know, on, on a donkey, and people are laying their robes and palm branches on the ground in front of him, and they're crying, Hosanna, which means save us. The people held Jesus as a king when he rode in to Jerusalem. So whenever he begins teaching within the temple, large crowds start to gather to listen to this. And that, by the way, did not set well with the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So they came along and they asked Jesus, they said, well, by whose authority do you teach these things? And Jesus asked them, he said, I will answer your question if you answer my question first. And then he asks them, he says, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. Well, they saw that they were in a no-win situation, and so they just told him, well, we don't know where it comes from. And so Jesus tells them, I'm not going to answer your question either, since you won't answer mine. So one of the things that the religious elite hated about Jesus was that he refused to play the game the way that they wanted him to play the game. See, the answer to Jesus' question was, was obvious that John's baptism was from heaven. John was baptizing people based on a heavenly command. But you see, the thing about it is, if those religious elite admitted that, that it was from heaven, then they would also have to be admitting that they have been wrong and that they are still wrong. So instead of answering them, Jesus tells them this parable instead. And actually, he told them another parable about the two brothers before that, but we're going to focus on this one. He tells them at this parable anyway, just to, just to kind of let them know exactly what the answer to their question is that, you know, his authority, it actually comes from God. So if you would, please join me there in Luke chapter 20, and we're going to be, begin on verse 9, which reads, And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some fruit from, of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed, and, and he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast him out. The owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they'll respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to himself, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? See, this parable would be easy for this audience to understand. 
I mean, it's a pretty simple parable. You know, the, 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 the landowner, he owned some land and he rented it out to some tenants to go out there and farm it. The tenants farmed the land. They took care of everything. And, and when the harvest came, they would split that harvest with the owner. To be honest with you, nothing's really changed in 2000 years. I mean, if you think about it, this is exactly what we still do today. Both of my neighbors to the north and to the south of me, they own the farmland that's in between their house and our house. But neither of them are farmers. They do not farm the land. They let that land out to somebody else who comes in and they, they plant the land and they fertilize it. They take care of it all year long. And then they harvest that property. And at some point they split the agreed upon amount with the person who owns the land. By the way, it changed a little bit because sometimes it just is done straight up for money. It doesn't matter how much the harvest is, but you know, that's neither here nor there. They, they split that money with the one who owns the land. See, but in this parable though, in this parable, the landowner, he sends a servant to collect his portion of the fruit. And actually, he ends up sending three servants. And each time that, that he sends a servant, you know, they, they beat them, they, they, they maimed them. Uh, you know, some versions even have that they killed them. So when he sends his beloved son, those who are renting the land off of him, they see their opportunity to take the land from him. Because the law back then, by the way, provided, you got to remember now, Farming's not changed much, but the laws that they were under absolutely have. The law back then provided that if there was no heir for that family, the one who possessed the land would, would own it. That's where we get that saying, possessions nine-tenths of the law. It, it pretty much comes from right there. So they killed his son so that they could have that land. Now, the earthly story, it, it's fairly simple to understand. And by the way, the, the allegory for the story is pretty simple as well. I mean, the landowner stands for God. The tenants, that's Israel. They're God's chosen people. He trusted them to reconcile all of creation to himself. The servants in there, are God's servants that he sent the prophets who Israel had beaten and maimed and killed them. And obviously, Jesus is his beloved son. So at the conclusion of the parable, when Jesus asks them, what then will the, land, will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Now Luke's gospel, by the way, it records Jesus answering the question himself. But in Matthew's version, Matthew has the people who are listening to the parable answering the question. So listen to what Matthew records in his version. When Jesus asks, what then will the, landowner, or will, the, will the owner of the vineyard do? They say, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season." And this reaction, by the way, it's, it's pretty much typical, in my opinion. I mean, people love to cast judgment and then to seek justice for that judgment. And they fell for this, by the way, hook, line, and sinker. They said, let's put these bad people to death, and then we're going to give that land to somebody else who will give the fruit to the owner. The reason that I really like this version, by the way, it kind of just molds nicely with last week's lesson, because if you remember for last week's lesson, when Jesus answered that wicked servant, he told that wicked servant, I will condemn you with your own words. Now, how well is that going to apply right here? They're going to be condemned by their own words. They said, you know, hey, we're going to, that, that guy's going to come and he's going to kill him and, and he's going to give the land to somebody else who will share the fruit with him. And see, Jesus has got them all pumped up now and, and they're all self-righteous. This is what the landowner's going to do. And they're all self-righteous. 
And then as we continue on in Luke, we're going to see how Jesus gets really serious with them now, and he brings the actual lesson that he wants them to learn from this. In Luke's version, in verse 17, he says, it says, But he looked at them directly and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. When it says he looked at them directly, looking directly at them, it ensures that those religious elite who ask him the question in the first place about whose authority he teaches under, it ensures when he looks directly at them that they understand what he's getting ready to tell them next. I am addressing this to you. You see, they understand that. This look that he's giving them, it's turned to a serious look. It's a piercing look. It's a convicting look. He's got their full attention now. Now Jesus can transition this back from the parable, which is the earthly story that they were all able to understand. He can transition it back from the parable to biblical truth what the scripture says. And Jesus is going to take them to the scripture to learn this lesson. You see, these are Israel's elite, religious elite people that he is talking to. They know the scriptures very well. They've spent their entire lifetime learning them. And Jesus just quoted this passage, that passage that he gave them. That's from Psalm 118, verse 22. They knew this very well. So let's understand what he's talking about by the stone. Because by the way, this always confused me in this parable about, wait, we've got a farming parable going on. Why is he talking about a stone now? I mean, we transitioned over to a stone because the lesson is in that from the scripture. So here's, here's, when when a building is being built right now out of stone or, or, or even block in these days, The first thing that's done, if you ever go out and watch them build a building from the very scratch, the first thing that's done is a corner is established. Go out there and watch those brick masons. They lay an entire corner up eight foot and however far it takes out because they need to get that corner established. It's how they still do it today. Well, back in the ancient times at that, a large stone was selected at that time and a lot of times they would take and 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 they would cut that stone they would chisel it out and it would become the cornerstone of that instruction you see they made sure that that cornerstone that it was cut square that 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 had 90 degree angle it was it was going to be square well sometimes when a cornerstone got sent to the building location, the people who were building the building would reject the stone because it didn't meet their standards. You know, maybe it wasn't square or whatever, but they would they would reject that cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone of faith. Jesus makes it clear to those religious elite that they are the builders that he's talking about and that they have rejected the cornerstone that God provided for them. And by the way, this is not the only instance in the Bible where Christ is referred to as a stone. You see, this imagery of Christ being a stone, it was revealed prophetically to Daniel. I mean, when King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream that he had, God revealed to Daniel, and Daniel explained that dream to him. See, Nebuchadnezzar saw a huge statue made from four different materials, you know, gold and and silver and bronze and and iron mixed in with, with clay. And the statue represented four great kingdoms that would be ruled in this world. And after that, Daniel explains to them what the materials represents. And at the end of that, he tells the king, he says, and as you looked on, as you looked, A stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then when Daniel starts explaining to King Nebuchadnezzar about what statue represents all that stuff, he says there 
And in those days of those kings, the, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever. Just as you saw the stone was cut from a mountain by no human hands, and that it broke into pieces the iron and the bronze and the clay and the silver and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. See, Jesus, when Jesus was telling them this story, they were well aware of this prophecy. They had the book of Daniel the same as we have it today, written word for word, just like what we have today. Their scholars back then were just as able to understand that Daniel was referring to Christ in this. God's chosen one, which is the stone that is cut without human hands. The Messiah that they have been waiting on. You see, and Daniel wasn't the only prophet who prophesied about the stone. Listen to what Isaiah says, the, the, the vision that, that he had. It said, Isaiah says, and he will become a sanctuary, a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the, inhabitant, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. And then God also tells Isaiah, he says, Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. You see, God told this to that prophet more than 750 years before it actually happened. And the religious elite listening to Jesus, they fully understood what all of this meant and that Jesus, by telling them this in that parable, they understood that Jesus was telling them that his authority comes from God, that he is God's own son, the chosen one, the Messiah. And they also understood that he was indicting them as being the wicked tenants. So at this point, I want to transition back from Luke's gospel back into, into Matthew's gospel to finish this passage because it's a little bit more clearer than what Luke's is uh, about the weight of what Jesus is teaching them. So Matthew writes, therefore, therefore I tell you, this is Jesus finishing this for these verses. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he was speaking about them. See, God had given his kingdom to Israel. They were his chosen people. He had reconciled them to himself. And they, in return, were supposed to share with other people so that everyone in the world could be reconciled to God. But instead, they kept the treasure hidden to themselves and they separated themselves from the rest of the world. They called what God had created other races and the Gentiles, they called them unclean. So now God is going to take the kingdom away from them and give it to others, the Gentiles or the church, because they will produce its fruit. So verse 44 here is a critical verse in this passage because it contrasts two different types of people in reference to this stone. When it contrasts these two different types of people, it says that there are those who, who will 
fall upon the stone, and then there are those who the stone will fall upon. And the passage says that those who fall upon the stone will be broken. But those who the stone falls upon will be crushed. So let's talk about that fall, that, that first set of people, the one who fall upon the stone and are broken. You see, when you reach, when you reach that point in your life and you realize your sinfulness, you recognize your sinfulness and your need for a savior, that's when you are falling upon that stone. And this usually comes from a position of brokenness because you understand your own sinfulness. You understand what Christ gave up to go to that cross and die for your sin. And you come in a position of brokenness to that point. By the time that you fall upon that rock, you absolutely are broken. Here's the thing. Broken can be healed. When you're broken, you can still be healed. I mean, there's no hurt beyond healing. There's no amount of sin that Jesus didn't die for. There is hope in Jesus because you can still fall upon him. But for those who never come to that point, those who are never willing to acknowledge God or to acknowledge their own sin because their pride keeps them from falling upon that stone, the stone will crush them. Those who reject Christ choose to stand judgment upon their own and they will be crushed. You see, crushed can't be healed. Crushed can't be repaired. The Greek word that we, that we render the English word crushed for here, it actually means to be pulverized into a powder. And that's what Jesus is saying will happen to those people who don't come to him. They will be pulverized crushed into powder. There is no healing. There is no redemption for them. There is no hope for them. And that final verse that we read, it shows that the religious elite, they knew that Jesus was talking about them. They knew that. You see, after Jesus had ascended into heaven, by the way, Peter was called before these very same religious leaders. Peter was called before them. And listen to what Peter says to them when he has to answer to them. He says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. The builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which one must be saved. You see, they understood everything that he said. But do you? Do you understand what he is saying here? Or are you like one of the religious leaders there who are just denying it because of your own pride refusing to acknowledge Christ as your Savior? If you've not placed your faith in Jesus yet, I want you to recognize that there is hope there is still hope that you can have in him. You see, here's the thing. You will never be crushed in this life. As long as you're still drawing breath on this earth and you are still in this life, you're just broken. There's still hope for you in this life. Jesus has invited you into a relationship with him. He wants to heal your brokenness. But the second you draw your last breath on this earth, the second that you leave this life, if you've not placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's over. 
that's when you will be crushed by the stone. There's no longer any hope. Once you're gone, you will stand judgment on your own. You know, we're not guaranteed another day. We're not guaranteed another second in this life. One of us could possibly not even make it out of this room. We never know. So I beg you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have never asked Him to be your Savior, make today your day of salvation. Now the application for those of you who have already placed your faith in Christ, Peter encourages us still with the stone references because he encourages us to be living stones. In his first letter, Peter writes, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, Peter refers to Jesus again as the stone rejected by men, but chosen and precious. And he says that, that you are living stones as well, building up a spiritual house. You too, those of you who have accepted Christ as your Savior, you are chosen, you are precious in the sight of God. You are a living stone. I want you to think about a stone, by the way. If you go out looking through the fields and you, you find a stone out there just laying by itself or you're walking along and, and in the stream you see a stone living there all by itself. Or not living there, but it's, it's in the stream all by itself. You know, that stone all by itself, it has little to offer anything else. It's simply just a stone. And that's the way we are. Individually, we have very little actually offer to anybody but as a member of the body of christ as a living stone we are all being placed together as living stones to make this spiritual house a house that gives that gives shelter to the broken to the hurting and to the hopeless the church the body of christ us put together as living stones, we are effective. So Jesus told them in this parable, parable, by the way, was not about farming. It was about that stone. And how are you going to react to that stone? Are you going to fall upon the stone or is the stone going to fall upon you? I beg you, while you're still drawing breath, Fall upon that stone. Come to Jesus. Amen? Amen? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we do just thank you so much for your word, Lord. Just as Jesus used your word to teach the religious elite of his day, Father God, we thank you so much that we're able to draw from your word, Lord. We're able to see truth in your word. Father God, as we, as we go out into this world, Lord, we just pray that you would Help us to be a light in this world, in this dark world, Lord. Help us to be a light. Help us to be salt. And help us to continue to grow in Christ. Father God, we just pray that you would also help us to recognize our own position within the body of Christ. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen.